It's very much pleasant to have everyone here for this event. My name is Travis McQuilkin, and I will be the moderator for this entire panel discussion. But of course, before we start, I would like to give or recognize uh, our only one, our only person from government, very short, that who is here is um, M Honorable MP uh, Sylvia Jacobs. Thank you so much for coming out uh, to represent the government of St. Martin thus far. Uh, and once again, thank you to everyone who came out this morning. But before we get into the heart of the matter, I will just let you guys know that I have 11 questions that I will pose to the audience. Those 11 questions is to help you to reflect, to think about what this day mean and what this whole um, panel discussion is all about. The theme of today is what we call human rights deficit in the kingdom of the Netherlands. But before we get into that, I would like to welcome and first of all thank the Anti-Poverty Platform and the USM, University of St. Martin, the leaders, Dr. Antonia Cormona Baez and Mr. Raymond Jesroon for collaborating together and putting this wonderful situation where we all can discuss and understand what it means to have a human deficit in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. At this point in time, I'm going to ask Dr. Antonia Carmona Baez to welcome us today. The show up that we have here is a show up of quality, and uh, we have here a sample of people who are interested in thinking about our society at large. It's very difficult uh, for many people to contemplate our society, to think about how things work generally, because we're busy with everyday things. My students, for instance, are full-time workers. They're also full-time students. They're working uh, from nine to five, and from five on, they're taking classes uh, in the evening. Uh, in my experience in higher education, uh, in Europe uh, and uh, here in the Caribbean and, and in uh, the United States. I've never seen uh, such dedication uh, as the dedication of students uh, of St. Martin, especially students here at uh, USM. And so um, I think that it is a privilege uh, for uh, us to have this opportunity to discuss uh, what is going on in St. Martin, what is going on in the kingdom. Uh, and I'm really glad that you are here with us. It was an honor for me to collaborate with the St. Martin Anti-Poverty platform. Uh, and uh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, I think that it was uh, very important. We've been taking on a couple of initiatives uh, lately, and we look forward to continuing with these initiatives. And I would just like to let everyone know, let the public know, uh, let the Parliament know, thank you, Member of Parliament, for being here and showing your dedication, commitment uh, to USM. I would like to let uh, St. Martin know that USM, just like St. Martin itself, is on its way to recovery. We're going to uh, build up, we're going to expand, and most important, we want to make USM that place of critical thinking uh, where members, different various members of the various sectors of society uh, can contemplate uh, our society uh, and uh, to look forward uh, as well. We've been ignored by governments. We've been ignored by the World Bank. We've been ignored uh, by uh, certain initiatives uh, that have been taking place here on St. Martin. Uh, there are many leaders who do not see USM as uh, a place or as an institution that can contribute to the recovery and social economic development. And I stand here before you in my nine months of being on St. Martin as a newcomer, uh, and I've come uh, to change that situation together in harmony with my colleagues, with my students, with our students, with my, uh, the staff, the faculty, and with organizations such as the St. Martin Anti-Poverty uh, Platform. Last week we had uh, on, on Monday, 
uh, International Day of Human Rights. Uh, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of uh, the declaration, uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights. We had, uh, together with the organization SAFE, uh, the St. Martin Alliance uh, for Equality, uh, we had a good discussion here, and a group discussion here, about human rights from the uh, civil rights perspective, uh, concentrating also on sexual diversity and women's rights. And um, we think that it is an opportune moment right now, today, that we uh, commemorate or dialogue upon the, that's what we call the uh, Kingdom Charter, it coincides with the 70th anniversary of the international or the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And so we, look, we hope to uh, spend the next couple of hours thinking about the Kingdom Charter, thinking about our position in the face of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and thinking about human rights. Okay? Within uh, that perspective, we would like to continue the dialogue for the rest of the day. So once again, thank you very much uh, for being here, and I hope that you enjoy uh, the next couple of hours in the dialogue. Now today, December 15th, we commemorate the 64th anniversary of the Kingdom Charter Agreement between the Netherlands and the Dutch Kingdom Islands. It was on December 15th, 1954, that the Netherlands signed an agreement between Suriname and the Netherlands Antilles. The six Caribbean islands occupied by the Dutch was known before as the colony Curaçao and subordinates. At that time, the Kingdom of the Netherlands was made up of the Netherlands in Europe, Suriname, and the Netherlands Antilles here in the Caribbean. Since then, the countries of the kingdom have conducted their internal affairs autonomously. The purpose of the Kingdom Charter Agreement, that's the way how I broke it down, because it's very important for us to understand what was the purpose of that whole agreement. Well, the agreement was to promote decolonization of the colonial territories within the kingdom, the Dutch Kingdom. At that time, the Dutch Kingdom already lost Indonesia, which became an independent country. Key word here, because I'm a teacher, and I like to ask these little simple questions decolonization, do you actually understand what that means? I mean, everyone here, I believe, is supposed to be scholars, so you, you probably know what it means. But just, just to give you a brief definition of it, um, the definition of decolonization based on Wikipedia is the undoing of colonialism, where a nation establish and maintain its domination over one or more or other territories. Keep that in mind. Our moderator already gave you some history of the colony of Curaçao and dependencies and Stacia and dependencies in those days before 1828. Stacia played a more pivotal role than St. Martin. It was Stacia that was the center of the SSS islands before 1828. But as he already gave you quite some history, I'll go directly into the Kingdom of the Netherlands since October of 2010, the so-called 101010, where four countries, the Netherlands in the European part, uh, in the continent of U Europe, with an estimated population of 17 million, and Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, the other three countries in the kingdom, um, in the Caribbean part, with an estimated population of about 300,000. The kingdom has authority over the so-called kingdom matters. All other matters, all other matters fall under the authority of the separate countries. The countries are autonomous in dealing with their internal affairs. But the kingdom matters, well, I want to share that with you as stipulated in the 
in Article 3 of the Charter, what we call the Statute R, click there for me, please, the enforcement of the independency and protection of the kingdom. Foreign affairs, dealing with foreign states and governments. Dutch citizenship, obtaining the Dutch nationality. The knighthood regulation. So when on April 27th, you get your decoration, that is a kingdom hood regulation that is a kingdom matter, as well as the flags and the coat of arms of the kingdom, nationality regulation of ships, and the requirements for the safety of the navigation of vessels that carry the flag of the kingdom with exception of the sailing ships that comes into our lagoons. The, the supervision of general regulations concerning admission and expulsion of Dutch citizens. European Dutch citizens are admitted by right, thus are legally admitted, but can be expelled based on, for instance, if considered a high risk for the country. Stipulation and conditions for admission or expulsion of foreigners. For instance, immigration and the residence permits. The extradition a regulation concerning sending especially foreigners back to their country who have committed criminal acts abroad. Other topics can be established as kingdom matters by mutual a consultation based on Article 38 of, the, touch of the, the Charter, for instance, national justice now is uh, kingdom matters and financial matters. That's why we have CFT. It was not so before, but after 1010, we agreed that it can become a kingdom matter. In 1997, Hirsch Berlin, member of the first char uh, chamber of the Netherlands at that time, pleaded for the institution of a kingdom parliament as the Dutch second chamber, they are, they, uh, they function as kingdom parliament. So the Dutch second chamber is our kingdom parliament. Understand that well. This plea originated from the need of Aruba and the former Netherlands Antilles to have more democratic control, more democratic input on kingdom matters. To date, this has not materialized. The former Netherlands Antilles and Aruba were of the opinion that they had very little influence in kingdom matters. And as such, their viewpoint could easily be rejected or dismissed or brought aside. The Dutch Parliament is de facto, as I said before, the Kingdom Parliament. The parliaments of the Caribbean countries have repeatedly expressed the opinion that there is a question of democratic deficit on Kingdom level. In 2001, the Council of State defined democratic deficit within the Kingdom as follows, the lack of complete equivalence in democratic representation of the population in decision-making on kingdom level. The constellation of the Kingdom Council of Ministers consists of 16 Dutch ministers, eight junior ministers of the Netherlands, and one minister plenipotentiary. One minister plenipotentiary for each Aruba, Curacao, and and St. Martin. The Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the Minister of Kingdom Re Relations representing the Kingdom matters established in the Charter of the Statute are considered ministers of the Dutch Kingdom. But when there is a discussion, all the ministers are present, and all of the 16, and also sometimes the, the secretary 
of states are present. So you know how you can feel sometimes overwhelmed. I was there, so I can tell you. Um, there is no or very little influence, influence of the representative of the people of the Caribbean countries in the decision making on kingdom level, as they are outnumbered in the Kingdom Council of Ministers. In June 2008, the Parliamentary Consultation of Kingdom Relations, consisting of representatives of the parliaments of then, in the, um, before 10, 10, 10, three countries in the kingdom, the Netherlands, the Netherlands, Antilles, and Aruba, um, installed an independent committee, um, the Committee Democratic Deficit, to report on democratic legality of decision-making in the kingdom. The committee was to submit proposal regarding solutions to mitigate, or if possible, eradicate the democratic deficit without amending the charter. On November 11, 2009, the committee democratic deficit presented the report choosing the kingdom, in which it gave an elaborate discourse on opinions about democratic deficit. The report, Choosing the Kingdom, mentioned the following shortcomings of the democratic functioning within the kingdom. I need to say that I was the chairperson of that committee. Shortcomings, according to us on that day, <coughs> on that time, identify which are still prevalent today are the very limited amount of kingdom legislation. In a year, if you have four, you have a lot. Modern times places new demands on democratic decision-making. The possibility of influencing kingdom policy by Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin is very limited. The influence of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin on formation of ordinary kingdom legislation is not being completely util utilized. We should use the statute possibility a little more. When the required consensus is not obtained are very unclear. Um, when you have consensus in the beginning, we have consensus, but at a given moment, if things change and the consensus is not there, then you can't come and say that it still exists because consensus is consensus through the whole process and not only at the beginning. And that how it ends is not clear, it's not stipulated. That's what I mean there. There is more room for delegated regulation on kingdom level than the legislator in the individual countries consider desirable. Citizens of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin often do not make use of their voting right for the Dutch Second Chamber. Citizens on the islands who are Dutch nationals can participate in the Second Chamber and the European Parliament elections by registering as a voter beforehand in The Hague and can pick up the ballot at the Dutch Representation Office. But there are some other shortcomings that are not mentioned in the report, and those are um, the absence of a directly chosen kingdom parliament with representation of the people of the four countries of the kingdom of the Netherlands. Lack of approachable multilingual information about the kingdom. Everything is in Dutch. The absence of a court of arbitration to solve mutual judicial conflicts, and they're fighting for that now in the dispute regulation, or constitutional issues among the countries of the kingdom. The report suggested the following solutions that are still relevant today. Make public parliamentary doc documents um, make public parliamentary documents and other relevant information that digitally available via your own parliamentary websites. Request the Kingdom 
Council of Ministers to publish a yearly strategic policy document that can be called the State of the Kingdom. Intensify the interparliamentary consultations. IPCO meetings are held twice a year. At the recent meeting in The Hague, uh, the reconstruction of St. Martin and the conflict resolution or the dispute resolution were discussed among other topics. I won't even tell you how that is going. Parliaments of the Caribbean countries of the kingdom should make better use of the existing possibility to influence legislation on kingdom level. So we can do better. Based on the charter, parliament, parliamentarians can research a law proposal and write up a report prior to public meeting in the second and first chamber. The parliament of the country can also send a delegation to voice their objection during the debate in the chamber. The delegation member has the right to amend and table motions. If a delegation member is against a proposal of law, he can request to postpone the voting until the next meeting. And that does not really happen. It, it might happen with a dispute regulation. <clears throat> Parliaments of the Caribbean countries of the kingdom should each appoint a permanent liaison <clears throat> to the second chamber to follow relevant policy and legislation on behalf of the parliaments of the country. This liaison can be compared to the minister plenipotentiary in the kingdom ministry. <clears throat> Regulating, to regulate the procedure, the nature and topics of kingdom consensus legislation, legislation in an Inter-institutional accord. What does that mean? That the governments and the four countries agree to the explanation, to the interpretation of the Charter of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The Kingdom government should use the same criteria to issue independent Kingdom general measure regulations. You know, we get those instructions and those in issued by Dutch government. The independent general kingdom measure should be based on the execution and or elaboration of a higher law. The principle of legality, which is not the case. So when we get our instruction, it's not based on any higher law. Neither the second chamber nor parliaments of the Caribbean countries are involved in the legislative process concerning independent kingdom general measures. A recent example of such an independent um, law is the kingdom measure on financial supervision. Other solution for kingdom regulation should be based on, on among others, instituting a kingdom parliament with a representative and sub substantial represent representation of the Caribbean Kingdom countries. Multilingual pu publication of legal products in at least Dutch and English. The representative office of the Netherlands on the island should use the media more, so the always is in front street, to inform the citizens of developments on kingdom level that can impact the different countries, islands. Establishing a constitutional court of arbitration to solve conflicts between the kingdom partners. In closing, I want to state that know that even though proportionality, they have 17 million, and all together we only have 300,000. Uh, in regards to number of population of the different countries could play a role. The lack of equal representation for the four countries in the kingdom is actually in contravention with the principle of equality as anchored in the fundamental rights of modern democracies. 
I thank you. Well, for the last couple of years, uh, I'm a trained I'm a graduate of the University of the Netherlands back in the old days when they were still in the Netherlands until they studied law at the UNA. And for at the UNA, I had a keen interest in our constitutional arrangement. And to put it very simple, I always wondered why we were still under Dutch influence and why were we not independent like, say, Barbados, uh, St. Lucia, St. Kitt. I always wondered why we never got to that status. And out of that, you know, that curiosity, I developed um, a, a constant, a constant of a questioning about the system. And so I decided to do some, you know, looking into it. And when I did so, lo and behold, I found out that the kingdom actually is constructed. The prior speaker spoke about a democratic deficit. Sure. What, I what I discovered basically is that all of those problems are caused because the kingdom is based on a logical error. And when I say that, I mean this. The United Nations Charter, which is an agreement among a, a treaty actually among all the countries of the world, has a chapter dedicated to colonial peoples. And all of the countries, the European countries, had at that time in 1945 submitted a list to the United Nations of territories which they were administering. And the thinking at the UN, especially by America and Russia, was that all European countries that had foreign peoples in what they call colonial subjection were supposed to give these people a full measure of self-government. The reason for that was because this was 1945, remember, the war had just ended, and America and Russia were telling these European countries, just as we freed you from domination by the Nazi or Nazi Germany, you should free the people that you hold in, com in colonial subjection and give them a full measure of self-government. Holland signed and ratified that treaty. That treaty has a chapter, chapter 11, which consists of one article, Article 73, and that article has as its objective to give all former colonies a full measure of self-government. What does a full measure of self-government mean? It means de facto independence. So coming from that point of view, I examined Het Statut. And when I did so, I had access to the debates in the United Nations in 1954 when Holland presented its statute. And lo and behold, to my shock and surprise, I discovered that the countries, the members of the United Nations, questioned Holland severely about A, the position of a governor. And they, they told Holland, if you are supposed to give these islands a full measure of self-government, why is there a government with a governor with these authorities? They questioned Article 43, which gave the kingdom some kind of guarantee powers. They asked, why do you want to have this power when you're supposed to give them a full measure of self-government? They questioned Article 44, which states that if we want to adjust our constitution, it has to be first approved by Holland. They questioned Article 50, which allows the government of the Netherlands to give directions via, via these, what we call them, a Koninklijke a KB, in English, an order in council. And they question Article 51, which allowed the Dutch kingdom to give instructions to the governor. So all of these things were pointed out to Holland as being in conflict with the full measure of self-government. What happened? After that was that the United Nations voted on the on the on the on the Kingdom Charter, had statute as we know it, and they disapproved it. I had never known that it was disapproved. It was disapproved by the United Nations. They told that they told Holland, you did not comply with a full measure of self-government. So what they did tell Holland was, was look, you no longer have to report on these islands which was one of the five demands that were 
in question of the prime, but the other four demands or uh, obligations that you have to comply with, and I will quote the words, they remain in force and can be invoked at the United Nations General Assembly at any time. Up to today, those things remain in force. To make a long story short, the United Nations Charter gave these islands the right of full measure of self-government. Meaning that since that right originates in the United Nations Charter, there is no kingdom law that can change, hold back, or put limits on that full measure of self-government. Recently, uh, I think on Tuesday, the court in first instance in a summary injunction brought by Stacia ruled on the issue because right now that issue of whether or not these islands have a full measure of self-government, that debate is taking place in court. It's a very important debate because the outcome will, will decide the future of the kingdom. What Stacia is arguing is this, basically, the United Nations gave me the right to a full measure of self-government. There is no law within the kingdom that can change that. And because I have a full measure of self-government, there is actually no role for the Dutch to play within the territory of Stacia, which actually means that Stacia will be a fully independent country within the kingdom. You can appreciate, of course, that this is quite a big step for a judge to take so we understand that the judge was kind of hesitant with it, but it's an appeal, and the fundamental fact is this. No court, nowhere in this world, can ever deny the fact that a United Nations obligation can be changed by national law, because that is fundamentally what Holland is claiming. They are saying that when we entered into this new kingdom relationship, we achieved a full measure of self-government, and that we are no longer under the United Nations Charter. Which, of course, is not true. As I pointed out before, the United Nations clearly stated that the Netherlands did not comply with the obligations. But furthermore, and I have the judge's sentence in front of me, and I'm reading it all the time with amazement. If we have achieved a full measure of self-government, then there can be no place for any Dutch presence on the islands. There can be no CFT. There can be no governor we will actually end up being fully independent within the kingdom. That is the debate that is taking place right now in the court of law on St. Statius. There are two cases running, but fundamentally, we have asked the court to determine that, yes, indeed, in fact, this right of full measure self-government is still in, in play, and number two, that any Dutch law that infringes on that full measure self-government is wrongful, unrechtmatig, which de facto will mean that the islands will be fully independent within the kingdom. The democratic deficit will disappear because we will have no longer the current relationship we have with the kingdom. So, to summarize, right now within the kingdom, a debate is taking place about the fundamental nature of the kingdom. And the fundamental nature will mean that the kingdom is going to exist or consist of six fully independent islands within the kingdom with the only relationship between us and Holland being defense, nationality, and foreign affairs. We envision, and the United Nations Charter envision, a relationship similar to what you have within the European Union between, say, Belgium and Italy. Both of them are members of the European Union. They share the same currency. They share a whole host of, uh, of activities together. But Belgium is in no way subjected to Italy, nor is Italy in any way subject to Belgium. But still, they function within the Union. We have the same situation in the Caribbean. All the countries of the Caribbean, the Caribbean belong to CARICOM but it does not infringe on their sovereignty. That is the type of relationship we are going to end up having with Holland. And believe me, it will happen because the legal basis for it exists. What happened for the past 65 years 
is that none of the islands realized this, and Holland conveniently did not want to bring it out either, because believe me, the debate we are having with Holland is something that Holland, the Netherlands, tried its best to avoid. But Station has forced the point, and now the debate is taking place within a court of law. So we believe and we know the outcome will be that eventually St. Martin, Curaçao, Aruba will be fully, fully independent territories within the kingdom. And with that, I would leave it for, the, um, uh, for, for a later um, uh, question and answer session to go into that in some more detail. But I'm here to observe the milestone of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But I think before we get into that conversation, there are some noteworthy observations about history and human rights in the Dutch Kingdom. In 1568, the Dutch engaged in the 80 Years' War with the Spanish, and their primary fight was for independence and religious freedom. After having been annexed by the French in 1810, the Netherlands fought a five years' war to regain its independence in 1815. And while the Netherlands was fighting for the liberation of its people, it was heavily engaged in the trafficking and enslavement of humans, most specifically Africans, the ancestors of the majority of St. Martin people today. And this continued for centuries. While emancipation of enslaved Africans would start with the British in 1834, it would take the Dutch almost 30 years later to finally declare emancipation for the people in its colonies. Since then, the Dutch Empire has fought in a number of wars, including world wars and a hundred year war. But for whatever reasons the Netherlands engaged, the freedom and independence of the Dutch people was paramount. The Dutch Golden Age was a direct outcome of the Dutch state's domination of world commerce and slavery. In other words, the wealth that the Dutch state was, has accumulated today was built on the backs of enslaved and colonized people. At the time when the Charter, or the Kingdom Charter, was established, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was already in existence for six years. Yet the right of the people in these islands to develop freely was not recognized in the Kingdom Charter. Rather, it is veiled, and the two presentations before me only added to my resolve, but it was veiled, or it is veiled, under notions of autonomous countries, equal partners within the kingdom, and for me, what is the latest ill-conceived and inappropriate term, and very troubling to me personally, is Dutch Caribbean. So no, I am not here to observe the Kingdom Charter. Rather, my conversation, my contribution to this conversation, if you will, is to pose some questions to the people of St. Martin. How can we, as a so-called part of the Dutch Kingdom today, speak of human rights and cultural development when the Dutch state would not even acknowledge slavery as a crime against humanity, let alone issue an official apology for engaging profitably and for centuries in what today remains the worst atrocity committed against a people by another people. How can we commemorate a kingdom charter to which our own so-called constitution or staatsregeling is subordinate? What kind of development are we seeking if not the full development of the people of St. Martin, which can only be attained in a politically independent St. Martin? How can our people fully develop if we are still subjugated to another people? And what do we really understand as developing our full potential? Let me quote a few articles of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a declaration I fully endorse and was also endorsed and signed by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And I might add, 
Article 1 states, All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This is the very first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. My question to you, St. Martin people, is are we in St. Martin equal in dignity and rights as those in the Netherlands? Article 5 states, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And I ask St. Martin people, was locking up a businessman for months on end in a police cell in Great Bay, which even the European court ruled inhuman, was that not a violation of human rights by the Dutch state? And they want St. Martin to pay for the fine imposed by the European court. Article 11 states, everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to law in a public trial at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his defense. And my question to my St. Martin people is this. Is this the case on St. Martin? Is everyone presumed innocent until proven guilty by an irre irrevocable decision of the courts? Or is it the other way around, that you are presumed guilty and then you have to fight to prove your innocence? Article 21, sub 3 states, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government this will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections which shall be universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. And again, I ask my St. Martin people, is this the case on St. Martin? Is this the case on Bonaire? Is this the case on St. Eustatius? And I could go on and on. We could spend all day here today citing the different articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which apparently do not apply to us here. That's my conclusion. In my humble view, these are what we should be discussing, not only on a day like this, but until we get satisfactory answers and can then claim that we are indeed, and we indeed do have, equal rights and justice as Brother Bob Marley would sing. But good afternoon. I'm uh, here representing St. Martin, St. Martin Alliance for Equality, which was started in 2013. Uh, it's an organization which seeks to empower LGBT persons uh, throughout, throughout St. Martin and also in the region. Um, I'm also a part of the Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Equality and Diversity, which is EK, which uh, has the mandate to work on that issue uh, on a regional level as well. So I want to start by saying um, I'm appreciative of being here, uh, even though I'm an, a whole island away on the unspoiled queen of the Dutch Caribbean Sable, uh, whose beauty is rivaled only by her sister island, St. Martin. Um, and I miss St. Martin greatly. So having said all of that, um, I want to talk a bit about LGBT equality, and I hope that I have the time to do so with all the technical glitches and also with my uh, young niece here laying next to me vying for attention. Um, with having said all of that, I'll go right into the paper that I wrote. Um, so in 2015, for the inaugural conference on internalized oppression held at the University of St. Martin, I wrote a paper entitled, Nigger, Are You Crazy? Imagining Equality Across the Kingdom of the Netherlands. My paper proposed that within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, there remains a systemic, systematic, and structural hierarchy based on the intersecting of race, place of birth within the Kingdom, thus whether you were born on the Caribbean side or um, the European side of the Atlantic, mastery of the Dutch language, gender, sexuality, religion, sexual orientation, access to higher education, wealth, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So a side note. Uh, my title was a reaction to an ill-worded review of Tana Hissy Coates' acclaimed book, The World and Me, by the Dutch media source Ars, um, NRC, which used its title, which used as its title, Nigger, Are You Crazy, when it was reviewing the book. 
Um, both the author and the newspaper defended the use of the word nigger, stating that in the Netherlands the word does not carry the same connotation as the word does in the United States and other places. Um, of course, people who disagreed with that, uh, in particular, uh, people who are already sensitive because of the ongoing debate about Zwarte Piet uh, said that that in fact is not true and was just a bit of um, Dutch uh, willful ignorance to the to the impact of the word on uh, uh, Afro um, Caribbean people. Uh, similar arguments are actually posited in the use for Zwarte Piet in relation to blackface in the Netherlands. Anyway, I'm digressing, um, but I wanted to say that what was important to me. Um, when doing the research and writing of that paper was um, that I became only more certain that the issue of inequality in the kingdom and on a kingdom level must be addressed, but not just from an emotional level, but also from a functional, functional one. So once we address it, what do we want? Um, how do we want to actually right the wrong? Um, of course, the inequality must be recognized, but more importantly is how do we address it moving forward? In order to find a solution, um, in order to find a solution, I believe that both the past and the present must be mined, but not just from a point of blame, but of acknowledgement and writings, thus writings of the wrongs against um, various groups. As a person who believes in intersectionality, I think that we have to start looking at the various approaches um, that we want to, to use that we want to uh, use in our um, discussions. Um, in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, one of the most vulnerable groups remain are, are, LGBT, are LGBT persons, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, uh, intersex plus, or the LGBTQI plus community. This is more so in the Caribbean parts of the Kingdom than the European part, though the struggle remains there as well. Many would suggest that the LGBTQIA plus community in the Dutch Caribbean has it much better than other places in the world, but how do we quantify much better? Uh, talk to a young person who has been kicked out of their home about better off. Talk to the youth tied up and beaten uh, by their parents about better off. Talk to the gay man held at gunpoint about better off. Talk to the child bullied in school every single day without any forms of protection uh, about uh, better off. The truth is that while LGBTQI plus persons may be somewhat tolerated in the Dutch Caribbean, we have a long, 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 long way to go in regards to acceptance and to equality. Um, but is this only a local matter? So I have to stop a minute to ask if you all are still hearing me because I can no longer uh, see. I'm just seeing that the camera is off. Okay, Lizanne. Uh, we can actually hear you. We're actually uh, very much into what you're saying. So please okay. carry on. Okay. All right. Okay, great. We, we can... um, so for nearly 70 years, the Kingdom of the Netherlands has led the charge in regards to human rights uh, worldwide. And for nearly 40 of those 70 years, it has been the champion for diversity with decades of championing for LGBTQI plus rights across the world behind it. Um, still on the home front, on the kingdom front, the members of the kingdom government refuses to directly push for comprehensive changes throughout the kingdom as it pertains to legislation and policies to protect and empower LGBTQI plus persons throughout the kingdom. The Netherlands since um, 2011 has a gender and LGBT policy which governs the manner with which these topics are engaged with on a national level, including the allotment of resources and more importantly, uh, it gives direction to the discourses about gender, sexual orientation and gender identity. Within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, including the best islands, um, there are 16.5 protections for LGBTQI plus persons, including uh, same-sex sexual activity being legal, this is since 1811, uh, equal age of consent, so for um, heterosexuals and homosexuals since 1971, anti-discrimination laws pertaining to employment since 1994, anti-discrimination laws in the provisions of goods and services since 1994, anti-discrimination laws in all other areas, so indirect discrimination, hate speech, etc., since 1994, anti-discrimination laws concerning gender identity since 1994, uh, provisions for same-sex marriages since 2001. In fact, the Netherlands was the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. Recognition of same-sex uh, domestic partnership benefits since 1998. Stepchild adoption by same-sex 
couple since 2001. Uh, joint adoption by same-sex couple since 2001. LGBT people allowed to serve openly in the military since 1973. Rights to change legal gender since 1985 and since 2014 without surgery, actually. Um, recognition of the third gender option since 2018, which is a large advancement for intersex people. Uh, cons conversion therapy has been banned uh, for, except for small pockets of organizations who still practice it, um, but it is actually banned in uh, the Netherlands. Access to IVF for lesbians since 2003. Automatic parenthood for both spouses after birth, which this action only pertains to lesbian couples. Um, commercial surrogacy for male couples, that's not yet um, recognized, but M MSMs are allowed to donate blood since 2015 with a wait period of a year. So in the, in the Netherlands, there are those 16.5 provisions, and the only one that is not made is actually a commercial surrogacy for gay male couples. But all of the other things that I listed are um, completely there, so protections for LGBTQI persons, or they're in the work. Um, meanwhile, in the Dutch Caribbean, not to be mistaken with the Caribbean Netherlands, aka the best islands, there are only 3.5 protections offered to LGBTQI plus persons. The half being that marriages performed in the other part of the kingdom and in the European Union must be registered on the islands of Curaçao, Aruba, and St. Martin. And that Aruba now has provisions for registers partnerships. This is not uh, this is not to be confused with uh, marriage. So for the rest, everything else. Um, so we have so the things that, that the Netherlands or in and Aruba have is the that same sex uh, activity is not illegal. There is still equality in the age of consent. Um, and LGBT people are allowed to serve in the military. But everything else, there is a big red X next to it. So there are no provisions um, or protections for LGBT persons on this matter. So for example, if somebody wants to fire you because you're gay, uh, technically, there is no uh, provision for it. Yes, you can. there is no protection against it. Technically, technically you can say, yes, in Article 16 of the Constitution, it says, that there should be no discrimination, etc. Et but there is no uh, provision, there's no actual policy or legislation that protects LGBTQI persons against that. Uh, the same with if someone refuses to rent you a house, um, there is no protection against it. Um, and in um, hate speech, there's no protection against it. Um, you cannot adopt um, a lot of uh, opposition to adoption for same sex. Um, couples on St. Martin. We even had situations where persons had to, um, like one person had to bear something and then actually give up uh, legal rights to another person in order for there to be some kind of uh, protection in case uh, a death happened or something. So these are the challenges that we continue to face. So um, within uh, the islands of Dutch Caribbean, again, not to be mistaken with the Caribbean Netherlands, the main case for the status quo seems to be rooted in the idea that the Caribbean part of the Netherlands are somehow more Christian than the European part. Um, this is just one. This is just one uh, challenge that we come up with constantly. Um, and for sure, I want to say that no one is arguing that uh, any religion uh, or any civil uh, servant lose their religion. You know that that's the religion is definitely something that is a personal matter. Um, but as an organization, Martin proposes that you know there is a separation between church and state, and that inequality must be addressed on the many levels. So on the individual level, on the community slash local level, on the regional level, on the international level, and of course on the kingdom level. Um, uh, as the husband of a friend is known to say, we are all strong, but together we are stronger. And I think sometimes uh, we forget that in our in our in our uh, strides for equality and our personal issues, we forget to look around and see the issues that other people are encountering as well. Um, LGBTQI persons um, of the kingdom deserve the same equal privileges and protection as every other citizen: the right to live free lives um, and life free discrimination, the right to thrive, the right to marry. And in my case, the right to divorce, um, the right to pursue happiness, and not just abroad, but at home. 
um, we need to figure out how we can work together to address equalities and inequalities on various levels. Um, but first, we have to start with acknowledging the inequalities that others face and not just our own. Um, as a Caribbean feminist, womanist, and African black, English speaking, woman loving woman who sometimes also loves men, well educated, small island weird, spiritualist, I think that it's important that individuals acknowledge the labels to which they self subscribe, but also that they look beyond them to their own to, to their fellow human beings to find similarities in order to do the work necessary to build safe spaces in which we are all equal, in which we are all equal, both on St. Martin and within the kingdom. Um, I think it's not, um, I think it's an excuse sometimes that on the national level, um, we continue to hear that the issue of LGBT equality is a local issue and that local uh, parliamentarians have to sort it out. I think that's a cop out from the kingdom and that uh, there is also a responsibility there for them to protect uh, the LGBTQI plus community on the various um, islands um, and the various countries in the kingdom. Um, Audre Lorde, the great Audre Lorde said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Malcolm knew this, Martin Luther King Jr. knew this. Our struggles are particular, but we are not alone. So um, as you continue to think about the various um, issues that uh, were spoken about today um, and in the discussion, I encourage you to listen to not just the things that sound familiar to you or make you feel comfortable, but also to things that make you feel uncomfortable and that are unfamiliar. And in, in those things, I ask for you to seek the kernel that is similar for those spaces that we can meet each other um, and we can begin to know each other better and lay the foundations for the work that lay ahead of us um, uh, as separate groups, but also collectively. Because I think that in addressing inequality in the kingdom, um, we need to understand that as my friend's husband says, we are stronger together. Our voices are stronger when we use them together. Um, a great friend of mine from South Africa always ends on every um, LGBT conference that we go to together with um, the saying, Amanda, I'll get to just to the people. And um, also, Aluta Continua, the struggle continues. And then we usually answer until victory is ours and until victory is ours. And I think we have to continue having the conversation about inequality in the kingdom, it is very important, it is super important. Um, and I think we have to find ways that we can hear each other across our various struggles and together create a platform that mines uh, the past, that recognizes all of the struggles that went into creating our islands and our communities as they are, the sacrifices made by the people who went before us, and um, that we actually work very hard um, to prepare a future for those that come after us. And actually, I had, I had recorded all of this and, and tried to send it to uh, Mr. Jezarun, but it, yeah, technology was defeating me. And in the end, I said that, you know, uh, history will look back on us and um, it will decide actually for our grandchildren or great grandchildren, seven generations from now, we'll look back and see if we figured out how we were the same or if we just kept squabbling about our differences. People were saying a lot of times that uh, I'm a lonely voice in the wilderness. And today you have seen it's not only me. And the topic that I have to address with you is the right to development. Deficit in that right. And also I will address the topic of the labor and social rights as an illustration of the deficit that we have in the kingdom. I will start firstly briefly with the declaration on the right to development. I will then compare the Netherlands and France because if we want to talk about St. Martin and the St. Martin people, then actually we have to look at both sides. Because we say that we are one nation one people, and one destiny. And so if we really want to get to that one destiny, then we have to start and reflect on what is happening on both sides. For today, we have been asked to look at this side because they want us to celebrate Kingdom Day. But the reflection, thanks to also the university, is for us to reflect upon this idea of the kingdom, as the moderator presented, 
It was first and foremost to decolonize. And secondly, it was for the human dignity and the respect of the colonized people that we would have an equal right throughout the kingdom. So I will illustrate for you how the development and the human development for France and for the Netherlands can be characterized. And then the question is, how is it here? And then with the illustration of the uh, labor and social rights, we will be stimulated to talk about what next. First of all, we are entitled to the full realization of all human rights. Not a partial realization. And that we find in Article 1, Sub 1, from the Declaration for the Rights, uh, for the uh, Right to Development. Every human person and all people are entitled. So also the people of St. Martin and also in the Kingdom of the Netherlands and in the French Republic. What is that right? That right is to participate in, to contribute to, and to enjoy economic, social, cultural, and political development in which all human rights and fundamental freedoms can be fully realized. Next slide shows us that the right to self-determination and full sovereignty of, over our national resources and over everything that we have above our soil and also in our seas, that that is something which also is implicated by the right of people to self-determination. We have to decide on those things. And then I have a very intriguing question for all those that have been fighting for St. Martin. What we had as Antillians, that was the colonized the colonized people in this territory, which was in the seas, the territorial waters of the Netherlands Antilles. Have we forsaken that? Or is that still part of our inheritance as colonized people by the Dutch and by the French? When you look at what you have on the northern side, you was a territory of Guadeloupe. And so what is in the surrounding areas of Guadeloupe, Martinique, what all the French have here in this, is that still your patrimony, yes or no? When we look at this, we have to start our reflection, and that's the opportunity of today, for us to exercise our inalienable right to full sovereignty over all our natural wealth and resources by, by, by deciding that we accept only a geographical territory. We forsake that right that we have as being part of the Caribbean, as being part as Antillians. And so it's something for us to continue to reflect upon. Because right now I can tell you, what is my right in the Sabre Bank? I had it. And because I want to become an autonomous part of the kingdom. I have to forsake it and leave it for the Dutch. Intriguing question. The gas and the oil reserves between Venezuela, Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire. I was born in Curaçao, and I'm still an Italian, and I'll tell you, no way that that patrimony has been given away, and now that we are here in St. Martin, we don't have any part in that anymore? Think of it because this is what is actually entitled in this right. It was the UN Charter, 1945, that said that we have to promote universal respect for and the observance of human rights and fundamental freedom for all, without discrimination of any kind. And then you know the nice list. And I'm very much interested in the last one, other status. Because they want us to believe at the moment that because we have an autonomous status in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, we take our own decisions and human rights can be interpreted here the way we want. And with that said, just to fast forward, so if you decide in your parliament here 
that the pension is thousand guilders. And you have to live with that? That's okay. That's autonomy. That it violates other rights? It was your autonomous decision. That's what they say. And that's why we want you to stand behind these articles. For you to know your right. And then to claim your right. And then also for do the things right. It was an obligation to provide us with a social and international order. That everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in that declaration can be fully realized. So the question, did the kingdom do that for us? Already the former speakers highlighted, not completely yet. By the way, this teacher asked how many rights we have. You know it now? Now you see it on the screen. That's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 30 human rights. Of course, you don't know it because you were in school, and they never taught us this at school. So the UNDP has developed, the United Nations Development Program, has developed a research into what is human development. And they constru constructed an index. And when we compare the index for Holland, the Netherlands, and for France, you see here in 2017, 0 0.931, for France, 0 0.901. One, then you have a complete human development. So the Netherlands still not there. And France still not there. But they are in the very high human development category. The Netherlands at the moment, 2017, last year, is number 10 out of 189 countries. And France ranked 24. And when you look from 1990 to 2017, how they developed, you see that was an increase of 12.3% for the Netherlands. For France, it was an increase of 15.7%. And they have there the figures from 1998 to 2017. That's how the United Nations is comparing all the countries that provide data. So you want to know what is the situation in St. Martin. We only could find a situation for St. Martin. Quel niveau de développement des départements et collectivités d'outre-mer, une approche par l'indice de développement humain from the Agence Française, and this was data of 2000. No fresh data. But what they could say from last year, not yet, but from 2000, 0 0.7. That's the level of development, human development that was achieved on the French side. What about the Dutch side? No data available. And the World Bank repeated the same statement in its last report. Next stage, the data needed to calculate this human development index, here you see a whole list. I only want to talk about you about this one, poverty. First of all, let me tell you something, definitions. What is poverty? And so what we have discovered is this. Every time you hear someone talk about poverty and you hear his criticism, they're not in agreement with you. It's because they have another definition in the head. And that is logical. Even in the Netherlands, you have the CBS, which is the Central Bureau of Statistics. They say that a single person must get at least 1,186 US dollars. This is it in euro. For him not to be in poverty. But the Social Cultural Planning Bureau in the Netherlands, they have another definition of poverty. They say... Not much, but sufficient to survive, then you need this amount, US 1,298. Whereas the European Union has a definition. They take the median income, which is put everybody's income from the lowest till the highest, and the one in the middle, take that one, and 60% of that amount, 1,956 for the Netherlands. Above that, you're okay. Under that, you need assistance. Complement what you get. 
Let's look at St. Martin. That side. Because they still don't like us as anti-poverty platform. The CER, which is that institute that advises government, in 2014 said, in their report, Boost St. Martin, the poverty line should be put on $641 a month. You see the thousand guilders? They went a little higher. How they defined that? They said, well, the United Nations Development Program said that they usually look at the minimum wage that is established in a country, and then you take 70% of that, or 50% of that, or 60% of that, you name it. And so when you make St. Martin, 1,500 guilders being the minimum wage, this will be the amount, which is less than here, but not as a social economic council. We go a little higher. Because that is what we, if you listen to the arguments, that we can afford in our economy. But Transparency International now, based on the Nibut research that was done in Bonaire, said, wait a moment, but a household cannot survive with those incomes. If two persons have to have a household, then they need at least 2,222 US dollars a month not to be in poverty. Transparency International used the Dutch Nibut Institute for budget information based on the research. And they said at the same time, it's because we don't have data for St. Martin. We used, with the cost of living of Bonaire, what people in Bonaire need not to be in poverty. So let me tell you, is cost of living in St. Bonaire higher than in St. Martin? Let me tell you, just for you all to know, confirmed last year by the Dutch Institute Ecuris, they did an, inst they did an investigation in, for the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs of the Netherlands. What are the prices here in the region for food? Guess what, St. Martin champion, highest prices of the region. And what they did, they compared 2010 every year coming up. And St. Martin beat all, even the United States, the Netherlands, all other countries by increasing prices. And they came to the conclusion it had nothing to do with transportation. So it's not fear the harbor. I can tell you things come through the harbor, go to the neighboring islands, and in the near room, are still cheaper than what we got here. So poverty definition is important. What is your definition? Which definition to use? Just look at the numbers. If we have to survive with $600 a month, ask any politician in parliament if they can survive on that amount. They were telling no, sir. And before 10, 10, 10, we know how they fought to increase for themselves salary and pension. And what did the Dutch parliamentarians and politicians say? No way, Jose, that too much. You remember that whole? But what happened when we discovered that and we went to look and calculate? The Samaritan politicians still don't have as much as the Dutch. Because when you take the secondary benefits monetarily, the Dutch champion again. But just to show you, even when you want to argue with equality, St. Martin parliamentarians were saying, I'm a parliamentarian now, so I should be paid the same way. And then still, that was not enough. That was not good for them. And what you see here in St. Martin is that we have a lot of people that start to criticize a decision which is an equal decision by even saying now that the ministers have to cut in their salaries, parliamentarians have to cut, whereas they don't respect the human right principle of equal job, equal pay. Next. So how can you get a better development and people out of poverty? For that, you need national development policies. 
Now, what is the clue? The first word in the article for the right to develop it is states have an obligation. Not country. Because right now, everybody is saying that we need the National Development Plan from St. Martin. This is a country plan. But it is the state that has the right and the duty to formulate an appropriate national development policy also for St. Martin. That aim, constant improvement of the well-being of the entire population of all individuals. The only intention made by the kingdom, and I had the privilege to be part of that movement, and we were in the working group for the integrated development of the Antilles. That was the first and the only intention for a development policy for all the islands of the Antilles. In this Article 3.1, from this right to the declaration, you see that it is the responsibility of the state. The creation of conditions favorable to the development of people and individuals is the primary responsibility of their state. So it's not only my government in the matter. It's the kingdom government, actually, that has this responsibility. That equality of opportunity of development is a prerogative both of nations and of individuals who make up the nations. So if we want to define a same matter nation, one nation, one people, one destiny, no problem, you still have the equal right, and you still need to get the equal opportunity to develop and to reach that same 0 0.937 that the Netherlands have now. Yeah? Why? In Article 6.3, and 6.2. Clearly it is stated that for you to have all these human rights, equal attention and urgent consideration should be given to the implementation, the promotion, and the protection of your civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. States should take steps to eliminate the obstacles to development, resulting from failure to observe civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights. So what did the kingdom do? They did not uphold what they signed in 1986. Because this thing there since 1986. And we, because we were not knowledgeable about what is our right, we never demanded for them to do it right. Next, constitutional obstacle. Mavis already illustrated democratic deficit. Bryson also illustrated a few of the errors in what the Dutch did with us. Here you have. The first obstacle is this. What is written in international public law? When you look at the Staatsregeling for St. Martin, it says clearly that international treaties has and have the legal status of being also law in St. Martin. But the same thing is being said for the Netherlands in the constitution there. So I ask you now, if international public law is saying you, you have the right to self-governance, and it's a full measure, why do you agree with partial measure? So when you sign a treaty, I have to defend the Antillian politicians that was there in 1954 on Kingdom Day when they signed. Dr. Fluminense da Costa Gomes said this was the maximum that we could achieve out of the negotiations. But at that time, the right to the declaration was not signed yet, to, to development was not signed yet. But the Human Rights Universal Declaration stated clearly. And the Charter of the United Nations stated clearly that all people, all nations, have the right to a full measure of self-governance. The degree of self-governance, in other words, is a limitation, higher supervision, as was illustrated by Rhoda, also by Mavis, is still there in the Article 43. We see it. 
And so we have a problem with what we call equal. Are we equal partners in the kingdom? So, more detail. Um, reflection on these issues. Yeah, have to be um, developed among us so that we have a better and clearer understanding of what it is that we really want. To eliminate the violations of human rights, it is in Article 4, it is the states that have to take resolute steps to eliminate the massive and flagrant violations of the human rights of people and human beings affected by situations such as these resulting from apartheid. We call what is happening in this part of the kingdom apartheid. We are not being in getting the same treatment. This is racism, racial discrimination. Why? Because the definition that the United Nations provide for it is not only if you have a other skin color, but if you are from an other ethnic composition and you're not getting the same human dignity, the same respect for your rights, then that is racism, that is racial discrimination. Colonialism, as the teacher said, the intention of the Charter of the Kingdom was to do away with colonialism, which was the power of the former colonizer on other nations. Who has the power here in Zimbabwe? We, the people, it is still the Dutch government. So that's colonialism. What we see here, we are being refused our fundamental right to self-determination. Our people that signed in 1954, the Charter of the Kingdom, when they said this was the maximum that we could get, when the Suriname delegation said, I want the right to self-determination in the Charter, formulated, the Dutch said, no. You and we have to understand that in this power struggle, this power game, there's no equality. Right? So what you see for today, the Charter of the Kingdom, in terms of human rights, obstacles have been presented, violations of our human rights, and we didn't see it, nobody told us ever to look at it, and then you need a sociologist bold as me to tell you, hey, I came to know that this is our right and what they do is not right. So it's only when we continue to inform and educate, that's why I applaud the university to open this opportunity for us to share and inform and educate that we can continue to evaluate. So necessary measures have to be taken. It's a responsibility of the state so if we talk about St. Martin, it's both the French Republic as the Dutch Kingdom government had to do things for us to be equal on both sides. And so equal that we are almost equal as on the European side. You follow me? Are those the measures that we have been seeing here? So in labor and social rights, you will see that Article 23, for instance, employment injustices. I only talk on this side for a while. Everyone has the right to work, but what you see? Civil servants in St. Martin, they just passed the law, 62 out of government. You can't be there anymore working. Or you can come now with a contract. That's still based on age discrimination for you to have the right to work. Free choice of employment. What about the people in Indian and Chinese employment policies here in Front Street, in, in, in the supermarkets? We have a young population looking for jobs, and they tell you, you can't work here. And they put nationals from another part of the world to be employed. Legal status or documentation. They prefer people that are undocumented because then they can abuse them easier. I, I tell it bluntly because this is the reality. They're not getting the salary slip. When they want to prove that they have been treated wrong, they can't prove nothing. 
But we don't have to jump so far. But the workers from the northern side that come today to reclaim their pension are being told, you was not in the system. I can't find you in the system. And so I can't pay you your pension. But you see the salary slips. The money was withhold. And you see also that it was insured with the same SVB. They even can show you the doctor card that he still have from that time that he was working as border workers. Discrimination big time. And they still can't solve it. Don't tell me that the Dutch don't know that this is happening with French nationals. And by the way, I see Mr. Halliger there. He even informed the French politicians to do something about it. And apparently they still are looking in how to do it because they still didn't provide you your right. So it's both states failing big time, yes. The right to protection against unemployment. In the Netherlands, you get the wee wee, the sweat, work low hate sweat, which means as soon as you get unemployed, your salary dropped down from what you had to 80%, then to 70%, and then, okay, that's not here. Oh, oh, sorry. It happens here. Only for civil servants and only for politicians when they bring down government. But the private sector workers, when they lose their job, it's only a social allowance they can get. No law for them. And this is for years already happening. Have you ever heard about the kingdom government giving an instruction to the St. Martin government and to St. Martin parliament to legislate that people can get an employment benefit just as the others in the civil service have? Not yet, right? So, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay and equal for an equal job. When you look at the geopolitical differences, we say it's not any more difference. This is just discrimination. Because when a Dutch man can come here, he can maintain his pension from there, or he can his maintain his salary from there, and you give him even something extra upon that. And he comes to work here, and you have to tell him everything because he doesn't know from here. And he earning more than you. It's equal job, equal pay. That is what we have learned. It's not happening this way. So we can do something about that. Um, oh yeah, there you see your border workers. Indexation, we're not getting it. Come next to the next slide. No living wage. I don't have to detail, you understand that already, right? Everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration. So what you see is that the minimum wages, if we compare the Netherlands, the Dutch side and the French side, we see a difference already. No equality in minimum wage. And don't even compare with on the other side. Social protection should have been and should have to be provided. If it is not sufficient, we don't getting it. Union rights, a social right. How oh, here in St. Martin and in the Netherlands, they did it all long before. How they get away of getting unions bigger. Providing people the opportunity to go to an employment agency. When you're an employment agency, you're not anymore in a, in a company. And so no CLA to be negotiated anymore. And these tricks all affect the rest of your rights. To represent workers in negotiations, even here, for instance, there are unions here that cannot represent their members because there is a law that says you have to get the majority and then I can sit with you. Whereas in the Netherlands, it is with all of them that have representation, they sit and they have to sit to negotiate. Next. Oh, right to strike. This was even... For the civil servants, the, the only exception that they made on the Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, that was excluded for the civil servants in this side of the kingdom. And until today, they didn't take it away. So why the kingdom doesn't want civil servants here to strike? 
Maybe it has to do because government has a lot of civil servants. I don't know. I just questioning, asking. Come, everyone has the right to rest and leisure. How can I have rest and leisure if I'm not even getting my Christmas bonus, my vacation allowance once I retire? Or I have an old age pension. Next. So the right to an adequate standard of living, let me stay there with the point of housing as part of it. We all saw what happened after Hurricane Irma. We know it already after Hurricane Lewis. If you want for the people not to get damaged homes, you have to provide them with better housing. Did the state provide an adequate housing for everyone? No, so complete right violation. Next stage, next slide. Social protection, unequal social protection floors. Here you have all these social protections that we have. When you look at the legislation, it is not equal. And we go to the next. Yes. The right to health. Mind you, this is a good one. The declaration says that we have the right to the highest attainable level in the state for health. The Dutch, for instance, make promotion on their website that for years in Europe and even in the world, they have the best ranking um, health system in the world. Is that what we have here? Mind you, what is included in it? Do we need to have access to that same quality of healthcare? We need to have facilities to that same quality of healthcare. And it should be affordable for us. Guess what? New hospital bed here in St. Martin will cost double the price as it was and it is in Curacao. Does that mean that now I have a better quality? I'm still looking for the price to compare with what it is in the Netherlands. I don't go even on the other side because they just signed no cooperation agreement for healthcare. We still need to get the details and then we know if we are getting equal rights, yes or no. Geopolitical inequality, we call it discrimination. We don't call it differences. Because if we do as if it is difference, then we say it's okay that we use autonomy to give you less than what you have to get on the other side. So that is where we come in and say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 70th anniversary, Article 2, states it very clearly, and I applaud the Prime Minister of St. Martin because on that day, Monday, she came out with this declaration and she read this article. But what she didn't read good was this part. She read, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political jurisdictional or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent trust on self-governing or under any other limitation of sovereignty. That's our situation. And you are our prime minister. So when you read this, you know what you have to do? Go back Holland and tell them, this discrimination has to stop. This distinction that you do in the rights that we have, you have to stop it. You have to give us equal rights. So that is full measure. All social injustices should be eradicated. It is in the declaration, Article 8.2. So if it is there, what should the state do? This is what they didn't do. Encourage popular participation in all spheres, an important factor in development and in the full realization of all human rights. So we commend USM by inviting us to do this, by inviting you to come out. We commend you to come out because that's how it has to start. If the state didn't do it and we start to do it, then we inform all, educate all, and then we can start to eradicate what is hindering our rights. So what next? <laughs> to ensure this, we have to come together. Next slide. Let us unite and fight for our rights. 
Thank you. Well, I don't have much uh, to say other than that uh, we were more than last time we met and organized an activity uh, here, uh, Mr. Yasurun. And uh, I hope that every time that we, together with the anti, the St. Martin anti-poverty platform and all friends and those who participate organize an activity to think, to contemplate our reality, that we bring some friends along each time. Uh, because uh, we can't think enough about our reality and about social justice and about our condition as Afro-descendant Caribbean people. So thank you, distinguished guests, speakers. Thank you, audience, uh, for coming. And please keep USM in mind as uh, we continue in our efforts to grow and to serve the community.